Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Well, as you know, Tracy, pregnancy is a time of well, great anticipation and sometimes a little anxiety Just thrown a in little. there. Too. Yeah. <laughs> you might wonder uh, and worry about the health of your baby, as most people do. Now, most babies, they're born healthy, but it is important to understand your options for finding out about what the risks are for even becoming pregnant and what the health of your fetus is once you do become pregnant. Yeah, some new technologies are making prenatal screening much more sophisticated. It's now possible for parents to be screened for certain gene abnormalities to find out whether future children might be at risk for developing a genetic disorder, and it's done with a simple blood test. And once you do become pregnant, a blood test can tell you if your fetus has a genetic disorder such as Down syndrome. Here to discuss these advances in prenatal and fetal screening is Mayo Clinic medical geneticist, Dr. Myra Wick. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Wick. It's nice to see you again. Thank you for inviting me today. Very interesting. Good to have mm-hmm. you, Dr. Wick. Uh, interesting about prenatal screening. Who, who ought to have prenatal screening? So prenatal screening is available to any pregnant woman. Um, traditionally, we've thought about it more in the setting of a woman who's advanced maternal age over the age of 35 um, because those women are at increased risk for having a baby with aneuploidy, trisomy 21 or Down syndrome 13, 18. Um, but testing is really or screening is really available to anybody who's interested in learning more about the health of their baby. So when we say prenatal, uh, you're talking about the woman is already pregnant, and then we're checking. Correct. Checking her. Correct. But uh, isn't there also some screening that's done pre-pregnancy? Right, preconception. Preconception. Um, okay. So we can screen parents for um, for certain disorders, recessive disorders, where both parents might be carriers and at risk for having a baby affected with one of those disorders. Traditionally, we've thought about more common things like cystic fibrosis. Um, but with our advances in technology, um, many laboratories are now offering what's called an expanded carrier screen where they might, care, they might test the parents for up to 120, 170 disorders, um, all recessive or for the most part recessive disorders to see if the parents are carriers. If both parents are carriers of the same disorder, they would be at risk for having a child affected with a disorder. So who ought to do that? Well, <laughs> um, say, because then it's decision time. But so who does right. that? Yeah. So um, it's really available to anybody, um, anyone who wants to learn more about their genetic risk is is somebody that might be a candidate. Do you have more and more patients that are interested in this? We do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're seeing more patients that are are interested, especially um, if they're going to. Um, of more um, in-depth measures to become pregnant so if somebody's going through in vitro fertilization um, they might choose to also do a big carrier screen to find out you know they're going through all this work to become pregnant they want to make sure they're having the healthiest pregnancy possible and how accurate is this testing i mean when you're done with the test and it's a blood test of both yep. spouses right yep then can you say you know there's a 98 percent chance that you're going to have a baby without a genetic abnormality no <laughs> so uh, there are probably twenty five thousand genes and over four thousand genetic disorders we're screening for uh, you know 200 or so so um, we're looking at things that are are more common, um, but it it doesn't rule out all genetic disorders. It doesn't rule out um, things that might be partially genetic or or have um, multi genes involved, like cleft lip or palate, um, congenital heart defects. Some of those things are not single gene disorders. But you can reassure the parents that there's nothing obvious on the things that you can test for. Correct. Yeah. And it's a good idea, f- you think, for, for most couples? I think w- as long as the, the couple has been um, adequately counseled um, so they understand what the limitations of the testing are and residual risk. And, uh, and, and you would say if someone, if they have some sort of condition in their family history, then that's who would be a person who's most interested? Well, not necessarily. So if there's a, a known family history of, For example, if we know somebody has a family history of cystic fibrosis, we're going to test them specifically for that, and we might do a more in-depth test for that. 
Um, but those individuals might also be interested in learning more about their genetics as a whole. Are there certain instances uh, um, where you can say to the parents, there's a 25% chance or there's a 50% chance that you're going to have a baby born with X? Yes. So for any of the recessive disorders, if both parents are carriers, so cystic fibrosis would be a, a common example, um, we know that there, that, that couple's at 25% risk for having an affected child. Let's talk about cell-free DNA testing. Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> so this is a relatively new screening test. Once a patient is pregnant um, and after about 10 weeks gestation, we can take a sample of blood from the mom. Um, when a mom is pregnant, the placenta is actually shedding DNA mm -hmm. into the maternal bloodstream. And um, we can take the blood sample from mom there's a combination of dna from mom and the baby hold on how can you tell if it's the mom's dna or the baby's dna well we can look for differences from what was paternally inherited wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we can use something called massively parallel sequencing where we amplify the dna millions of times um, and then use a complicated um, calculation algorithm um, a lot of those algorithms are um, put together by the laboratory and very complicated, but they count the number of sequences from the various chromosomes. And if the baby's affected with Down syndrome, for example, we'd see extra counts from chromosome 21. Um, what about uh, testing and amniocentesis? Yep. Wh which women ought to ha have that? Not a blood test, but where you actually take some of the amniotic fluid and test that. Right, great question. So the cell-free DNA is a screen. So if that comes back abnormal, it tells the couple that they're at increased risk for that condition, but it doesn't definitively tell them that the baby is affected. So in order to, to prove the results, we would need to do an amniocentesis where we actually take a sample of the amniotic fluid that contains cells from the baby and then do the, the chromosome analysis to, to verify the cell-free Similarly, if we have uh, a woman that comes in and her ultrasound shows multiple anomalies, maybe um, the baby has a, a cardiac condition, um, that would be another case where we see abnormalities on the ultrasound that we would recommend an invasive test or an amniocentesis. And let's finish off this discussion with whole exome sequencing. Yes. What does that mean? So um, whole exome sequencing is the latest and greatest in genetic testing. Um, we're just kind of trying, starting to enter that um, realm with prenatal screening. Mm -hmm. um, it does require an amniocentesis or an invasive. We wouldn't do it with cell-free. Um, but we're essentially looking at the whole exome, all of the encoded genes in an individual to see if, um, if there's a genetic condition. So what about the folks that say this is, uh, this is a bad road to go down because you're talking about both boutique babies. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's slippery slope. Right. Um, so right now the whole exome we're using in the situation where we have a baby with multiple anomalies, multiple mm -hmm. findings, um, and we've done some traditional testing and we've come up without a diagnosis. Um, so it's really meant for a very specialized um, group at this point in time. So does insurance cover this? Not always. Um, and the cost um, is substantial. Usually we're talking seven to $10,000. Um, and, and the insurance is all over the map. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. while medical genetics has come a long way, mm -hmm. hasn't it? And prenatal screening, the new technologies are unbelievable. It is. Thanks for sharing the information with us. You're Do welcome. Dr. <laughs> Myra Wick, medical geneticist, Mayo Clinic. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.